and ask to be guided by you through this time. We ask this in your name. Amen. Spirit, I know what I must ask. I fear to, but I must. Who was the wretched man whose death brought so much glee and happiness to others? Answer me one more question. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they the shadows of things that may be only? These events can be changed. A life can be made right. Would you show me this if I was past all hope? <laughs> I, I will honor Christmas and try to keep it all the year. I will live my life in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons the spirits have taught me. Tell me that I may sponge out the writing on this stone. <laughs> oh, spirit, please speak to me. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> yes, the bedposts were his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Hi, guys. We're back. We promised we would be. Mm -hmm. But the thing that made Scrooge happiest of all was that his life lay before him. And it could be changed. I will live my life. Well, there's more. Come Christmas Eve, we get to see the next part. I hope you weren't too scared with that music, Albert. It was getting scary near the end. <clears throat> Thank you all that have participated, and it's wonderful to, to share with the family on the dedication of little Dawson. I was going to change my title. I was going to call this Great Expectations, but some of you Dickens followers might think, oh no, not another book. And, and that's another story of Dickens, but, and it's scary too. We have been... Well, I've really enjoyed this challenge of facing the facts that it's so much easier to go about getting ready for Christmas and be a humbug. I, I just find that, that a, lot, a lot easier for me to just be grumpy and say that price is too high or there's too many of those people around or there's whatever. And, and the challenge that we've all been faced during this Advent series that we've been sharing is that that's not good enough. That doesn't match what we believe in terms of what Christmas is about. We need to be singing this hallelujah. We need to be sensing the hallelujah. So, we've been, uh, you've been following along, and each week we've had an a insert for you to take your, the sermon notes home. There's no insert, but it's in the bulletin, just in case you were uh, paying attention to everything else in the service and didn't get a chance to look at your bulletin. Ray, it's in the bulletin, Okay. It's right there for sermon notes to follow along.
But I would want to, do want to talk about expectations. And Larry was talking about with the children, and, and certainly uh, those thoughts have been crossing our minds every time we think of, get the list out and say, okay, what do, does this person kind of expect for a gift? Or I don't want to disappoint them, or I want to surprise them. And so the word expectations comes up, whether we say it out loud or not, at Christmas time it's there. My question could be asked, what are you expecting for Christmas? And there's a quote from a guy named Fred there in the bulletin that you can read. He, he wrote Santa a letter and he said, because he wanted to know what he was getting from Santa, he says, um, Dear Santa, did you, not, you did not bring me anything good last year. You did not bring me anything good the year before that. This is your last chance. And maybe... Your kid <laughs> uh, figured out you were Santa and sent you a letter like that too. That would be exciting and a different kind of expectation. When we think about expectations that we have of ourselves, and we think about how we feel when we don't measure up, oftentimes it's similar to the feeling that we have when somebody else doesn't measure up. We're disappointed, a little bit angry. And often, like Scrooge, in the little clip we had there, he was searching anywhere for some hope. And he was able to put it together that if the, if the ghost of Christmas future, the, the ultimate in hoodies there, well, that was kind of scary. With the, but anyway, uh, that ghost, Scrooge was able to figure out that if the ghost was sharing this information... Maybe there was a reason for the information that there was some hope that Scrooge could change. And it's a marvelous thing that uh, Charles Dickens was able to surprise all his readers as he had gone through, and apparently, uh, like some of the other Dickens stories, they were put into the newspaper week after week. So people would follow along kind of like people do with TV shows now. They couldn't wait to see what would happen next. And what a story. Scary and, and but exciting because there's so many parts of it. Poor people could be excited because the rich guy was getting it. And the rich guy, rich people would say, oh dear me, I hope the people, you know, all that kind of stuff. The Dickens twisted it and turned the people around in his storytelling but he knew God. The historians tell us that he wasn't very public with his Christianity, but he, was, he knew Jesus. He wrote a, I told you before that he had wrote a Christmas story that he shared just with his children that wasn't allowed to be published until after all his children had passed away. And it wasn't until 1934 that it was published. A wonderful telling of the Christmas story. But there was hope for Scrooge, as we find out. At his graveside, he's shown that what had been his life all the way along, and it, the thing that Scrooge really got was that his life did not measure up. I don't know, the sound wasn't up very good at the beginning, but he said, show me the name of the person that everybody's so excited that he's, and happy that he's dead. And he realized that he hadn't measured up. He begs to be given a second chance to alter the outcome of his life. He wants a different ending, so he asks if there's any hope. When we think about our need for hope, whether or not you have done real well this Christmas and only got caught saying humbug or having a bad attitude just a few times, that doesn't make any difference. We have a need for a the ability to do it right and not just live for ourselves and hurt others, but be changed, continually changed by the power of God to be recreated into what he wants us to be. So what about us? Has the humbug to hallelujah been helpful in this week, this, this month? Because we're challenged to look to see why we get so bent out of shape. We're looking for hope 
And I want to share a few things here, and I've got them down there, A, B, C, D, and I just want to talk about things that will help us to feel this hope at this time of year to change us, to change our attitude, what the Christmas story and what the, the wonderful gift that God has given to us in the, name, in the way of Jesus Christ changes us and gives us hope. The first one is accepting the truth about life and about ourselves. This business of truth, it comes up quite a bit at Christmas time. And depending on the age of your children, you may be feeling guilty that you're not living out truth because in our society, for, to a certain age, you're supposed to pretend things. Right? And everybody cover your kids' ears. Oh, they can't hear us right now. Santa Claus doesn't exist any more than huh, Papa Smurf. Sorry, Stu, don't cry. What about truth? When we come together as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a unique perspective on truth. Because who we follow said these words. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. An incredible, it, there's no question about it. We have been given the truth through Jesus Christ. We need to understand that the truth about life, the biggest truth is, or one of the truths is, that we all die. Now, that's not a truth that too many people argue about. They may argue in the way they live and, they're all, and the, the choices they make. They act as if they're never going to die. But there is the truth that we all will be done with these bodies at some time. And it's the fear and lack of understanding about death and God's good news of eternal life that are such an important part of this Christmas story. It, we've talked and shared how the, there's extra pain at Christmas time for broken relationships, for uh, folks that are experiencing the loss of a loved one for the first time at a Christmas time. And, and that's maybe extra special, but it doesn't go away. Christmas time heightens the emotions. Because, and so there's extra pain at Christmas time instead of all the glory hallelujahs and peace on earth feelings, it's just downright lots of pain and sorrow. So we want to have hope. And we can have hope when we accept the truth that God has given us eternal life. And when we accept the truth about death, we realize that we need a savior and we need all will face judgment day and that God has only one plan. And that is that we be in relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, he, who he sent as the baby to live among us, to die and then defeat death for us. The wonderful truth about life and about ourselves. And then we need to accept the truth about God. God's purpose in all of this isn't to discourage us any more than the doctor intends to upset us or insult us when he tells us the hard truth about our diseases. You ever, well... I don't want to get into that, but one doctor tried to tell me something about my, my health, you know, and, and uh, I didn't think it was very nice of him to use the, the obese word. I thought it may be a little chubby or something. <laughs> and, and he could suggest that maybe I walk more or something, but take those pills and, and you know, I shouldn't have really felt so insulted by him instead of just listening to what he says. But God doesn't intend us to feel insulted or discouraged when he tells us that we are in need of healing. He has given us uh, the opportunity to be right with him through Jesus Christ. <laughs> and some people just get their back up and they, they get grumpy over that and say, well, how does he know I'm not any good? And, and, and what's with that? And, and things like that, so we get insulted. But as we learn the possibilities for healing, we realize that God's goal 
isn't to put us down, but to redeem us. To bring us into relation, back into relationship with him. To enjoy the life he has given us. Forever. Now we can't relate too much to, to understand what's going, on, going to happen in the year when we, after we die. That's, we just don't know very much about that. But imagine that God has given us Jesus Christ so that we can enjoy now a life in the midst of all the storms. We can have wisdom. We can have peace. And I could ask any, many of you to come up here and, and share that wonderful testimony of how in the midst of the most gruesome and sad things, because of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you have felt a sense of peace and joy. It is a, a wonderful expectation, a wonderful joy. In our scripture reading, we heard of the story of the wise men a little bit, but we know it from years, every year we hear the story of the wise men. They had a wonderful hope of a relationship, uh, understanding more wisdom about the way their world worked, and they spent their whole lives apparently studying these things, and then they came up, they were, the star was revealed to them, and they wanted to go and worship. And off they went, and they searched for the for God in this way. And in the story, as we know, Herod had different ideas, and the wise men were at one point having to make a decision whether to follow Herod's rulings and, and directions, or they listened to the, the voice of God and told them to go to home a different way. So they changed the ending. They didn't get cause very thing that they were worshiping to be destroyed or let it happen by Herod. Herod wrote his ending too and his was jealousy, rage and you want to read gruesome things well Herod, almost everything about Herod was gruesome and his attitudes and his things that, well his fear well we know the story that he had babies killed hundreds, thousands of babies so that he could remain king or in control of things, and, and yet all he ended up was with, with death. He wrote, by making his decisions, a gruesome death. But expect, accepting the truth about God, the message that Jesus is Savior, we have hope. And I want to share a few verses from 1 Peter. It talks about this wonderful expectation. It's from 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. It says, All honor to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter writes, For it is by his boundless mercy that God has given us the privilege of being born again. Now, we live with a wonderful expectation because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. For God has received, reserved a priceless inheritance for his children. It has kept it in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. These trials are only a test to your faith to show that it is strong, what is strong and pure. It is being tested by fire. Fire tests and purifies gold, and your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong after being tried by fiery trials, you will bring it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day of Jesus Christ when he's revealed to the whole world. So we accept the truth that God has for us a wonderful, wonderful things to expect from him. We also need to pay attention to God. We need to remember that action is required. And... and you know that some not-so-smart fathers and mothers thought it was a real good deal to buy this present, and they didn't see the part that said, some assembly required, <laughs> and then they wait till Christmas morning. Well, in this wonderful expectation, this wonderful thing that God has given to us, there is action required on our part, and that's obedience. The wise men followed the stars. We're not necessarily to do that. We have the word of God. And we can look to God, to his word, for direction and instructions for living. 
But as we do that, we do need some hope. We do need some help. And, and it happens. It's sad that there, there, somehow some one particular gender, let's say, has got a reputation. I'm not sure it's warranted, but one particular gender of the two uh, has got a reputation for not necessarily looking for the instructions soon enough. Like, we can do this. This is not so hard. And then we get told again, did you look at the rules? Did you look in the rule the instruction book? Okay. It happens to all of us as believers. It, we get, and we hear it all around. What should I do next? Or why isn't the church growing? Or, or why don't I feel the peace of God in my life? Or why do I take two steps forward and one step back or one step forward and two steps back or whatever it goes and you say, why, why, why? Well, some of you guys, if it helps, just let put it in her voice and say, read the instructions. That's what she's saying. And that's what God says to all of us, you women too. Get the Bible open. Read the instructions. God hasn't left us alone in this. Not only does he speak through his word, his word tells us that he will speak to us. Now that gets a little spooky. You kind of sound to think, oh boy, he's getting back to this Charles Dickens stuff with the ghosts and stuff. But God says, and he, he says, I will live in you. My Holy Spirit will be in you so that when you have a thought, your thoughts will be changed to be my thoughts. Your desires will be changed to be my desires. And I can tell you that it's amazing when that happens. And I can see and look on your faces, some of you, that you know what I'm talking about. How often do you let God speak to you? He will. But it takes action. It takes, well, it takes kind of no action. You've got to actually plan to be in a position and in a place without all the gadgets going, without all the other stuff going, and the word of God in front of you, and you ask the Lord to speak to you. You can help him out and say, I need help in this area and this area, and, and what do you think about this? He doesn't mind that at all. But you've got to stop and listen. Let the Lord speak to you. Pay attention to God. We call it a prayer life, and sometimes that spooks people. They don't know the Lord's prayer all the way through and they're not sure which ending to use and all that stuff and so they get, they get all messed up with that and they go, oh, I don't think I can pray. Just be quiet before God. If walking and talking, the way some of the hymns put it, helps you then, or Jesus as your friend helps you in your prayer life, just be quiet before him and God will speak to you. And does speak to you. And then you'll begin to see hope where there was no hope before. We also want to finish off by talking about being ready to make sacrifices to follow God's leading. You say, we recognize that little comes without a cost of some sort. We think of those wise men. We don't know how many months or years, but travel wasn't easy in those days. And maybe they weren't all convinced all at the same level, but the ones that were convinced drove the others on. Let's get going. We need to travel on these camels all these ways. The wise men traveled. They, had, they sacrificed in order to worship. We begin to understand the joy and the hope that God gives when we understand the joy of giving gifts. That's kind of the giving back to God. Recognizing that when we think of other people before ourselves, and we're not just thinking about me, but we think about others first, then it opens a whole new world of, of giving. We think about what other people need, and we say to ourselves, Lord, help me be a good giver. Help me to give to others the way I like to have be given to. I heard a story of, or read a story about a, a, a missionary in Africa. 
And he had taught the, the students all about how Christians exchange gifts at Christmas. So on Christmas Day, he received a beautiful seashell from one of the students. When he was told that the student had walked many, many miles to a certain bay, the only spot where these shells could be found, the missionary said, I think it was wonderful that you traveled so far to get this lovely gift for me. And the student replied with bright eyes and a smile. He said, the long walk, that was part of the gift. The long walk, that was part of the gift. The wise men took a different way home, the Bible tells us. They were changed, probably could never ever be the same people after they had worshipped Jesus, the baby, after they had been given direction by, the, by God and saved their lives and saved Jesus and all that stuff. And so in their interaction, they were made different. They had learned the joy of giving and of worship. It had set them free from themselves and their fear. They had found hope. And in our little clip about Scrooge, what a difference it was as he realized that he had hope. He could change. He could change his attitude. For us, changing our attitude at Christmas isn't easy. For some reason, it, I don't know, maybe it, it doesn't feel that way for you, but it's just kind of fun to be grumpy. And I'm sure glad that the, the Dickens came up with this character so that we could all be called Scrooges when we were grumpy, eh? Because that's what has happened. When something feels good and, and it's easy to do, then it's really hard to change. And we recognize that this business of this, call it a virus if you want, of, of being just hanging on to the hug, humbug stuff. The trouble is it makes us so vulnerable to more stresses. Makes us vulnerable to never seeing the hope and never passing on the hope of Jesus that Jesus gives us. God wants to speak into our lives. He wants us to be different. He wants us to be cheerful. And recognizing and passing on the joy that he has passed on to us. Those angels... <laughs> As I said a couple of weeks ago when uh, we were describing or talking about the, the angels singing to the shepherds that uh, it must have been a hilarious scene. First of all, nobody comes out to sing in the she on the fields and, uh, and these angels, they knew who Jesus was and they had known for beginning of time that this moment was going to happen when the the apple of God's eye, these silly little humans that had been created, and this is from the angel's view, I'm sure, were now going to get the chance to be different and be right with God. So those angels would have been so full of joy so that when we say they, they sang glory to God in the highest peace on earth, they must have been holding back the giggles. And maybe some of them even had the giggles. I don't know. But let's, as we put away that humbug, we can take on that kind of joy that this is Christmas stories about us and God giving us an opportunity to have a wonderful expectation. Will you let God change you this Christmas so that you're different than any other Christmas? He did it for us. He sent his son to be our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts that you give us. Thank you for the relationship that we have been given to be, in, be right with you now and for eternity. Lord, this week as Christmas is coming and the world celebrates with us, or lots of it, certainly the, the merchants are excited to be a part of this Christmas story and, and we want to, we're given so many opportunities to tell what the real story is about. 
We can't do that, Lord, without you changing us, changing our attitude. Give us a, a bounce to our step and a, a joy in our lives that you have come to this earth so that we can be right with you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen.